Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos from Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington. You'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, this is Ken McCarthy and the Jazz on the Tube podcast, and today we've got a really interesting call. As you know, we love to talk with educators, and we especially love to talk with educators who are also players. And today we have someone from a really unique background, and it's going to be an opportunity to discuss a, a lot of little-known things about jazz history. Our guest today is Carl Gerhardt. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you on the call. And as you're going to see in, in a few minutes, Carl is, has been very involved and is con- con- currently involved with the Navy in various capacities. But one of those capacities is as a player, as a band leader, and as an educator. And I thought this would be an interesting call to shine a light on a little discussed aspect of jazz history before we start talking with Carl. So much of the formative years of jazz were influenced by military affairs. For example, everybody should be aware of James Reese Europe, the band leader of the Harlem Hellfighters. These were African-American musicians and also musicians from Puerto Rico who went over to France. They fought valiantly. They were some of the most decorated infantrymen in history. They were also incredible musicians, and they helped introduce the sort of a pre-jazz sensibility to Europe. And we all know that Europe has been a huge patron of jazz over the years. In fact, I'm not sure jazz would would look like what it looks like without the help of all the European countries that provided homes to American jazz musicians and playing opportunities and film. We have a lot of film from Europe. And James Reese Europe, a military man, is the person who kicked that off. A lot of people don't know that Buddy Bolden's uh, trombone player, Willie Cornish, was in the Spanish-American War. That brought him to Cuba, and he spent a while there, and he came back from Cuba with a different kind of sensibility, which he helped introduce to the New Orleans music mix. The Onward Brass Band, which was a band out of New Orleans, also served in Cuba, and as musicians, they couldn't help but absorb the things that they were hearing. They brought that back to New Orleans. The original Dixieland Jazz Band did a lot of playing in England during World War I, a lot of troops heard that music, troops that otherwise might not have heard jazz, and a lot of Europeans heard, especially a lot of English people. And of course, the UK is a great market for jazz. So we have these many instances where military musicians played a really important role in transmitting, I would call a jazz sensibility to the world. And of course, we've got the incredible alumni, musical alumni of the Navy. John Coltrane was a Navy man, played in the Navy band. Tito Puente, probably the most important Latin jazz musician, certainly in the United States, Navy man, and actually went to Juilliard, uh, the benefits after he got out of service. So this cross-pollination between the military and the advancement of jazz is a really common theme that's not necessarily visible unless you sort of look at it and and specifically focus on it. And today we're going to talk about somebody who's at the center of that, who's been at the center of that, has experienced it in many different ways as a player, as an educator, as a band leader. And we're going to talk about his career and the things that he did as an educator in the Navy, his, his current playing, maybe a little bit about what he's doing today. So Carl, again, thank you for being on the call. Your instrument is the trumpet. Is that right? Yes. And I always like to ask this question, what was it that fire in you that made you decide, hey, I want to play that thing? How do I do it? Well, it's funny how that actually started. Um, I always loved all kinds of music, but, you know, where I grew up, grew up in New Jersey, and the way the school system was, you, you start out on a recorder, 
in third grade. And then if you want to play an instrument in fourth grade, you, you select an instrument. And I always would spend a lot of weekends at my grandparents listening to the big band albums from the 30s and 40s. And I was just enthralled really by uh, Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw. And uh, the clarinet really just kind of blew my mind. So anyway, I, I really wanted to play the clarinet, but I was, you know, I was pretty involved with with sports and that kind of thing with all my my buddies and and it seemed that they were all going to take up the trumpet in fourth grade so i said oh what the heck i'll just i'll play trumpet as well <laughs> and so yeah we all started trumpet in fourth grade and in fifth grade i think almost all of the rest of them quit and i was the the one left over but quickly picked up on it and just i spent seemed to be all my free time up up in the room uh, kind of playing along with whatever came on the, my parents radio uh and also uh, listening to the albums and just kind of just getting into that music. They say the difference between a, a musician and a music student is a mu- music student has to be reminded to practice, and a musician, people are telling him, would you put that thing down for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> if you talk to my brothers and sisters, you, yeah, they tell you that that story is true. There you go. And who in the jazz world, besides the big band people, was there? Were there any soloists that that uh, caught your fancy? Well, you know, the more I played trumpet, I guess you know, listening to that genre at least, you know, obviously Louis Armstrong. I think I had about four of his albums, and it just hmm. broke the needle on all of them. There was just some great stuff that was probably later on, though later later recordings of the the fifties and sixties. Harry James. Al Hurd, Doc Severinsen, all the the big players of that time. Then when I got to high school and started really kind of getting into jazz a little bit more and competing for, you know, the regional and the all-state bands, I was influenced by, you know, Clifford Brown and Mm. Clark Carey, who I, you know, still one of my favorites just to, to hear and try to emulate those kinds of players, you know, certainly early Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie, players that where I could try at least to, to you know, steal a few of their licks, you know, that they were I was able to do, but there's so many folks that I listened to at the time, I think it just kind of influenced my playing overall. You mentioned that you're a product of the New Jersey school system and, and their approach to musical education. And you just mentioned band competitions. Can you tell us a little about how they worked and the role they played in encouraging musicians in your generation? Um, yeah. You know, I was just so, so fortunate to be a part of an incredible music program starting in uh, junior high school with my band director. It was huge just an incredible band there was a lot of a lot of kids in the band but each one of them you know it we the product that was put out was just incredible so by the time i got to high school the band director there was he was a no-nonsense man his name is norris birnbaum and the material that he would pick for our concerts at least in concert band was just you, know, you, you don't know any better you just you just play what's put in front of you but probably one of the finest concert bands high school in, in the state of New Jersey at the time. Also, uh, he was very, very nurturing in the way that you had to play different styles of music. And he had a good dance band. He played a lot of the 40s style, wasn't really, you know, not really bringing up too much modern stuff at the time in the 1970s, you know, the later big bands. But, you know, he took it very seriously. So I, I took it seriously. And, and I really wasn't a great reader but by the time I got to high school, you know, I'd spent all my study hall hours with him. And just one day the light bulb went off and, you know, music, you know, reading music came second nature and obviously opened a lot of doors for me. So, you know, being a, I guess, kind of a big fish in a pond, or in that pond at least, you know, he said, you know, you need to get out there and start competing statewide. And I was very fortunate to make the New Jersey All-State Jazz Band as the soloist. So with that, you know, just the three days of rehearsal down in Atlantic city and playing the music that we played and and playing with the other kids. It was just, it just blew my mind. It was just such a great time. And I knew that, you know, at the, at that point, you know, I wanted to be a musician for the rest of my life. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. So Mm. that was just a a great stepping off point. Well, I'm proud of New Jersey. I actually grew up there myself. I don't know what town you're from. I spent a lot of time in Montclair in Essex County. I'm glad to hear it had such a great, I was part of the parochial school system and we didn't really have any music, okay. but I'm glad. I mean, what what, what uh, high school, what programs did you go through there? 
I went to Ridge High School in Somerset County. And okay. at, at the time, yeah, you know, Basking Ridge at the time was kind of a sleepy town up until about the early 70s when AT&T moved in. But we were a very small high school. We were, I guess, a group two, which is almost the smallest, and group one being the smallest. But I, I played sports in high school. You know, I, I played football all the way through my senior year. And, you know, that's another thing. I had great, a lot of support from my football coach and Mr. Birnbaum because, you know, they allowed me to play football. I didn't have to play in the marching band. And I was able to do both and balance both. So I was very, very fortunate to do that. That's great. I, I, I um, invariably find when you come across a, an accomplished artist that there was a, an, an infrastructure network of educators that helped create the platform for that person to excel. Obviously, the artist himself has to do the work, but it really helps when you're surrounded by people with high standards who are also encouraging. And for people that don't know, New Jersey is a competitive place. There's a lot of people that live in that little state. And I used to play basketball, and I can tell you it was, it, it was not a walk in the park when in a competitive situation in any place in New Jersey. You had Newark. You had East Orange. Newark is kind of a music powerhouse. So many great musicians have come from there. And then, you know, the city's this the state's very populated, so there's a lot of interest in music, especially because it's close to New York City too. That probably had a, an influence. So I imagine, did you go straight from high school to the Navy, or did you go through college first? No, I, I didn't go right into the Navy at that point. You know, I just kind of played gigs in town and tried to meet other musicians, and you know, try to keep keep down a couple odd jobs. You know kind of floundering a little bit, but with a little bit of musical direction. And then, actually, my, my high school band director, at during World War II, he was in the Air Force Band. So that always kind of interested me that there was a career opportunity in military music, but I just didn't know what it really entailed. So one thing led to another, and I was able to look into the Navy music program, which, you know, by all by all accounts was was definitely the one held in highest regard. And then is that where you went then after that, after uh, graduating from high school and spending some time playing gigs? Right. Yep. I joined the Navy and um, I think I turned 22 when I was in boot camp. And, you know, you, you finish your boot camp. I was down in Orlando. Then you go to the Navy School of Music where we train Navy, uh, Marine Corps, and Army all those musicians would come through that school. So I went there after boot camp and, and spent a good six months there and graduated and then went off to my first band in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And the training itself is, did you say is in Orlando or, or is that where your boot camp was? No, the boot, the boot camp at the time was in Orlando. And then the school of music, which is still there now is, is in the, well, in the Virginia beach area. They call it little Creek. Okay. So you went through the training, and then you were assigned position in a band. How many bands does the Navy field? I think now we only have 11 fleet bands, and then the two, the two bands, there's, we have a band in Washington, D.C., and there's one at the Naval Academy. So at the time when I joined, I think there may have been 14 or 15 bands, but they've since, uh, due to realignment of the military and, and drawdowns, unfortunately, they've uh, consolidated to larger fleet concentration areas that, you know, we still cover the whole globe, mm -hmm. but we're, we're a little bit displaced as, the, you know, compared to when I first came in. And what does a Navy band do? What, what kind of gigs do they play? And what's their, what's oh, their wow. function? Obviously, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess all military bands have the kind of same mission. You know, we, we project, you know, well, at least in the Navy, uh, I could say we projected the Navy's image. You know, we told the Navy story and through music. And I was very fortunate to be stationed not only in the continental United States, but a couple of times overseas. So specifically, you know, when you're, when you're overseas, your, your mission is a little bit broader where you're taking basically, you know, when they see the, when they see the band, that's a Navy band or a military band, you know, you represent – uh, not only the armed forces of the United States, but you you represent America. So they just we would have great great crowds to play for overseas, and you know very very appreciative of American music. But at home, you know, we would also play patriotic parades, concerts. We would we would take our bands to schools. I had a great partnership and education program that we would 
participate in with not only elementary schools, but up through uh, high school and colleges and pretty darn busy. You know, we would, we'd also you know, support changes of command, retirement ceremonies, any, any large military event. We'd also support funerals and ship commissionings. So the band was always on call. The phone was ringing off the hook. And depending on how many folks you had in the band kind of dictated how many missions you could support. So it was, it was a great time. So lots and lots of gigs, no, sh- no shortage of playing opportunities. No shortage of playing opportunities. I think one of the greatest benefits, though, well, to serve your country, I, I guess the longer I stayed in, the, the more that meant to me. And, and to see the, the folks, the younger folks that were coming in, the folks I had the great opportunity to lead, you know, they came in to serve their country, and also they were just brilliant musicians. So, and and it's it's hard to get through the door. You know, uh, the auditions are very very stringent, and obviously, you know, you have to be within height and weight standards, and you know, have, have a, a clean background to get into the service. But you know, by the time they get into the band, you know, you're you could play a, a classical job in, in the afternoon, and at night you'll be playing a a jazz reception. You see, you have to basically play all kinds of genres when you're in a military band, especially a Navy band. Let, let's talk a little bit about that the training that you received in the village of uh, the uh, Virginia Beach area. I have a colleague, Bobby Sanabria, who's a percussionist and a band leader himself. He teaches at the New School, and he also teaches at the Manhattan School of Music. And I've heard him say more than once that, and he made special reference to the training that, that the Navy gives its musicians, that the Navy covers in six months what the, a typical conservatory would take two years to cover. Is it fairly accurate, do you think? There's definitely some truth to that. I think that you know within a six-month time frame, you're going to be exposed to a lot more than you would be in a, in a differently paced program. Because we're basically, we, we need to get you through that school to get you out operationally and out to a band. And I will say that, you know, a great majority of musicians that come through the school, you know, they obviously, you can't get there without being an accomplished player in your own right. So mm-hmm. uh, basically, you know, tuning you up to, to play in a military band, you know, showing you how the, to, to march in a band or, you know, the, the different styles of music that you're going to play. And that, that would certainly prepare you. So, and some folks, it would only take a month or two, and then some people would have to stay the whole six months just to make sure that they're they're prepared to come out. You know, so it's a great experience and one that one that folks, I think everybody that has gone through the school, whether whatever service you're in, you know, the Navy and the Army and the Marine Corps, they look back uh, as a very positive experience. It's very it's a very interesting setup too, because typically people will go to conservatory, and it's very unclear what will happen <laughs> when they graduate. But right. in in in, the, in your situation in the Navy and the other military bands, it's crystal clear <laughs> what's going to happen when you graduate. You've got you've got gigs waiting for you. You've got missions ready to go. And of course, that's the the bread and butter for for a developing musician is playing. You know, playing with others. I mean, there's there's practice and and wood sh- wood shedding and all that. But you also oh, yeah. need to spend a lot of time playing with other people to develop that dimension of your playing. So in the Navy ample opportunity. It's probably not a surprise then that, that some of our famous musicians who've gone on to be sort of world-changing, we mentioned John Coltrane and, and Tito Puente, and I'm sure there are others, had that experience of getting to play a lot and getting to perfect their chops and perfect their ensemble playing. So Absolutely. how many years were you, how many years were you as a player with, with the Navy? Well, I, I spent a total of just over 30 years, and I guess the first 15 of, of my 15 years of my my service I was pretty much just a player I had opportunities to lead uh, smaller ensembles but also play in them you know big bands or jazz combos or be able to conduct ceremonial bands and that kind of thing and then we have a program in in the Navy it's, it's to become a band officer you know to be the officer in charge they select one or two each year and then you go on to more of a, obviously, a musical director role, an administrator. You know, you are the guy or the gal in charge with respect to uh, military service. So you are a naval officer and everything that comes with that. 
and spent the last half of my career as a band officer. So I was very fortunate to be able to you know, conduct the bands, but also, you know, I would be in charge and be responsible for everybody's welfare, their professional and personal development, also be in charge of the budget and everything that goes on with running a band, you can understand. So, but the good thing about that was you had a great opportunity to, you know, affect change. And certainly, I guess, as I look back, probably the greatest joys, you know, weren't just all the standing ovations that we would get is, but being able to help out folks with, with them getting promoted and them getting ahead. And I still look back, I'm still a lot, a lot of folks that I've stayed in touch with since I've got out of the Navy and, and folks that, you know, importantly for me, growing up in the Navy, I had all those leaders that I looked up to that I'm still very good friends with and that gave me an opportunity as a young, uh, a young musician in, in the Navy band to, to excel. So it's just, you know, doing the best job you can and get, taking advantage of the opportunities that were out there for us. So yeah, the last 15, 15 years of my career were just uh, very, very rewarding and, and was able to not only, you know, lead the bands, but be able to be stationed all over the world and kind of send the Navy message out there and be responsible for it. So it was just a great time. So you 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 had the administrative role, but you'd also be the actual conductor and director of of the unit too, musically. Yes, well, not all the units. You know, I think my last the last band that I had, I think we had when we were full strength, I had forty five people. So when we wow. when we went out on a, a concert band or what I used to call pops ensemble, kind of that that presentation where we we would give the audience a little bit of everything, you know, a little bit of all kinds of American music, rock and roll, a little bit of swing, you know, of course, concert band literature, that kind of thing. That was mm-hmm. kind of my show. I would conduct the band for that. And, but we had smaller units within that band. I had an 18 piece big band that had somebody lead for us. I had a smaller rock band that would go out on high school recruiting tours and they would work for the commander, uh, naval recruiting command. So, there were certainly other leaders within the organization and just empower them to do their job. But, you know, at the end of the day, of course, you were in charge. So basically, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. And this is, this is a great tradition and it, it goes back a long time. I don't, I don't know when the first, maybe, maybe as long as the Navy existed, it's had music, musicians. Yeah, believe it or not. Know. There was the one of the first what they call ratings or job specialties in the Navy was was musician, you know. On, wow. On yeah, on, on wooden ships there was uh, <laughs> there, there were musicians on those ships, and you know after I guess the at Vietnam era I guess saw the the greatest number of Navy bands, official Navy bands. You know all you know ships even in, uh, today not every ship has a band, so. But back back in the day, as they say, we had almost triple the amount that we have now. So, for instance, if there were an aircraft carrier, it would have its own band. Very well, could, right? Wow, wow, amazing! And they would they would perform for the the sailors and and then other for special occasions and and for the public when they were at, at dock somewhere. Right. So they basically embarked with with a an admiral, you know, when the the admiral would have his his ship, whichever his flagship they would call it, and uh, you know each each area or each admiral for whatever area they're in charge of would have their own band. In in preparation for this call, I was, I was doing a little research, and if we if we think back to the time before televi- before the internet, before television, before radio, before the movies, bands, large bands, were a major major, major source of entertainment for everybody. And, and the, of course, the Navy had bands, the Army had bands, but even police departments had bands and fire departments had bands. And, and they, it's just, it, was a, it was part of the, the whole culture of America to have these big bands available for parades, for special events, municipal bands. I was in Havana a couple of uh, weeks ago, and Havana still has a, a municipal band. They play down in the old city, um, the Plaza de Armas. And, you know, it's, it's a, I don't know how many, dec- I mean, it's, it's 100 years old plus, and they still maintain that tradition. And, wow, they can really play too. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a great, it's a great setup because, as you know, one of the biggest challenges musicians have 
is opportunities to play. And it's great when, when those are plentiful and, and relatively uh, easy, easy to find. And you can just focus on the music, not on scaring up work. Right. So did you spend time as an educator at the conservatory? Is it, do they call it a conservatory? No, they don't. It's, a, it's called the – well, now it's called the U.S. Navy School of Music. And like I think I said earlier, the, the three services that were, were represented there, the, the Navy, the Army, and, and the United States Marine Corps. Ah, so, the, so the Navy has, has the role of, of educating two other branches of the military in, in music. Right. Well, at one time, the, the Army was, was folded in. I think they're now more on their own program, although they still are housed at that institution. But but basically, you know, even regardless, all with the same mission that they prepare for. So mm-hmm. within the same time frame, they're getting basically the same kind of education. And did you have opportunity to teach there as well? I did. About halfway through my career, uh, prior to my becoming a band officer, I worked at the, the School of Music. I worked in the advanced academics department where Mm -hmm. I went on to teach arranging to the more senior folks that would come through. They would, they would come through initially after boot camp, and then they would go to a couple of different duty stations and progress in their own career. And then they were given opportunities to lead smaller ensembles where they would have to come back to the school to get further educated. So I was teaching in one of those courses that prior to my the time that I got commissioned and went on to become a band officer. Well, since I, since I have the opportunity to talk to someone that teaches arranging, one of our projects at Jazz on the Tube is bringing educational materials down to Cuba because they, they actually have some great big jazz bands. They've got one for the secondary school, the National Secondary School, and for their National Conservatory. And it's hard for them to get materials or even guidance on a lot of them are self-taught who are then in turn teaching the students are there any specific reference books or, or materials that you think are really essential or really helpful for teaching people the art of arranging i'd be hesitant to just pick one out i say yeah i kind of stay away from that question a little bit okay is it so it's better to get a wide smattering of different approaches and different authors and absolutely okay so there's 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 no one stop shop for arranging. It's 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 something that you just have to go broad and get as much exposure as you can to as many different styles and approaches. Absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. So be, would directors, band directors, write their own arrangements as well as or or you know run their units? You certainly could. There's there's plenty of arrangements out there that we could purchase, but it, it's great to have at least one or two folks in the band that could. Uh, you know, if there's a particular song that you wanted to play, you could get somebody to write it out quickly for whatever instrumentation you had at the time. So, like we were talking earlier, back in the day when they, you, tr- you couldn't just go online and, and download a PDF of a chart, you needed somebody in the band that was able to write it out correctly. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the good thing about you know, the military bands is you're going to run into a good handful of folks that are already... By the time they get to you, you know, they've already have maybe one of those skill sets where they can provide you that service. And you, I think you mentioned earlier that the admission to this, these programs is very competitive. So people are already showing up with, like you did with a lot of study behind them and a lot of playing experience, obviously, before they even apply. And, and, then, one, you know, and then they get refined from there if they get admitted to the program. Right. It's really the only job, I think, in the service where most jobs you could come in if you have the aptitude, you can learn your technical position after you get into the service. But mm-hmm. becoming becoming a military musician, you already have to be at that level prior to joining because basically you're doing what you've, you know, you got as you progressed in your own, you know, education from fourth or fifth grade on, you know, you've been honing those skills. So they cultivate those skills once you get into the military. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I've worked with doctors. I've worked with lawyers. I've worked with engineers. I've worked with all kinds of professionals 
over my lifetime. And I admire people in the music profession because they are among the best trained in their profession and they are continually developing. It's not the kind of thing where you can do a couple of years in school, get your diploma and, and coast. You, you have to keep sharp. You have to keep honing your skills and expanding and growing. And it's a, it's a very unique profession in that way. Absolutely. Speaking, speaking of, of honing skills, we've talked about your involvement with, with the Navy as a player, as, a, as an educator, as a director, but you've also played a lot of gigs outside of, of the Navy environment. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how that took place and how that works? Were you able to play while you were in the Navy or, you know, how, how did it, how did it happen and who did you, who, who did you play with? Well, I always had the opportunity to know wherever, wherever I was stationed, you know, I was stationed in South Carolina first and Virginia and New Orleans and overseas in Italy and Japan. I had great opportunities to play with not only the musicians within the Navy, we were given the opportunity to play outside of our military duties, which is, you know, if there's, that's a great way to, to meet musicians in the area. But I've, you know, th- through my lifetime, I've been very fortunate to to play with some some really neat bands on on the I say on the outside. So, so I got a chance to play with the group Fish and went on tour mm-hmm. with them back in the early '90s and have kept a very good relationship with that band. And great horn section that I played with at the time, the Giant Country Horns, with Dave Grippo and Russell Remington, and we went on to to do quite a bit with them. And uh, very recently, we're back together as a horn section again, playing with, with, with other groups as well. So uh, one of the bands being Twiddle, another group called Pink Talking Fish. I've had some great opportunities to play with other groups on the outside. So it's it, especially now after that I'm out of the Navy and not working as you know, the director, I get a chance to play my trumpet quite a bit more now. So, Oh, great. Great. And also, Fish, just, oh, go ahead, please. I was going to say I'm also just recently joined a band called Room Full of Blues, and they're they're celebrating their their 50th anniversary this year, and it's they're a great blues band with with horns. So certainly enjoying playing with them recently. That's great, and and people I think recognize the name Fish, and they fall into the category of a, a jam band. Could, can you describe for people that may not be familiar with your music what it's like? Well, they. They cover basically in, in one show. They would cover probably all genres of music, you know, it, with a heavy basis on improvisation. And you know, they have an incredible following, and and they really put out a wonderful show. Not only to to hear the band, but to go see them live with the light show and whatnot. So, just an incredible group of musicians. They really are, and wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guys to know. That's really encouraging. So th- this is quality music, and, and they, they play a, from a broad palette, and, and they're exposing young people and, I guess, older people that have been around, been fans for a while to a broad spectrum of music at a high level. Absolutely. And uh, tell me, maybe if you would, some experiences with them, some gigs that you did with them, like places that you would play, the kind of audiences or, and venues that they'd, they'd play in. Well, in the early 90s, I think they were just start starting to get quite a following at the time. And, you know, they're, they're a four-piece group, and they'd reached out to us and said, you know, hey, we want to do a tour with horns. I was in the Navy at the time, and I was able to come back to uh, my director at the time, my boss, and, and ask him for some time off that I normally wouldn't get. You know, I usually get about two weeks in the summer and two weeks in the winter when you're in a military band because of of all the all the commitments that you have to take care of. So, but he was very generous in game of the time. I guess he saw you know some there was some some value added there because not only would it, it was very being nice to, to me, but I was I was going to come back a better musician because of you know the experience I was going to get with playing with Fish. But so we started our tour in Burlington, Vermont, is where the band's from, and we made our way down the East Coast. And they booked the tour basically whenever I had to be back to my the Navy band, you know, there was a, there was a drop dead date that I had to be back at work. So they booked gigs all the way up to the day that I had to come back. So I guess if I had another month, they would have made their way to the West coast. I think we made it down to Atlanta. Wow. And 
Yeah, As we, I think we did 14 or 15 cities during that tour. It's pretty neat. What kind of what size audiences do they attract now? In the tens of thousands. I think they're the biggest touring rock group, maybe in the history of music. That uh, they rival uh, the Rolling Stones as far as their audiences. It's just incredible. Uh, back then, we had it wasn't as big, obviously, but it was was pretty darn big. We played we played some open air places. We also played some festivals. We did some larger venue rooms. So some great it's times. Great I can say that. Yeah, it's it's so that was sort of their formative years getting getting established as a national band. Right, exactly. Wow, it, it's great that the, the Navy gave you that flexibility to, to go out and have that experience. That was quite wise on the part of your director. <laughs> I'm forever thankful for that time. And, you know, that spawned other opportunities to play with them, you know, on you know, basically going up and sitting in all by myself, you know, wherever I was, and you know, wh- whenever they would come through town and, and more opportunities to uh, help promote one of their later albums, you know, a few years later, you know, where they they would fly me out to California and that kind of thing. So it was, like I said earlier in the conversation, I've always had a great relationship with, with that band, and they've been so generous with the opportunities for me to, to get up there and play with them. So That's great. And and now you're, yeah. you're, you're in Newport, Rhode Island, and you're working at the – Navy Senior Enlisted Academy. Yes. And I imagine you're you're taking advantage of any playing opportunities that crop up. I know Newport is famous for the great jazz festival. What's the scene like there for jazz or for playing opportunities? Well, at, you know, New England in itself, is, especially this area of Providence, Newport, great opportunities to get a, get a chance to play with the groups I mentioned earlier, but, you know, just the local musicians as well. We have a couple study things that go on downtown Newport, and just the the, the nucleus of, of great musicians in this area. The past few years for me, at least, kind of getting in the scene, because when I was in the Navy here as the director of the Navy band, I didn't do much playing. I mean, I knew of people that were playing out in town, but my my Navy job just kept me so busy. I just didn't have really have the time to do much. But then, you know, you meet one person you play with one band and they they recommend you to somebody else and and that's kind of how the ball ball got rolling with regard to that so there's it's just a great place for music it always has been uh, not just for the jazz fest but year round that's great that's great to know i think most of us are only aware of newport as as a festival location and, and the idea that it's has a jazz culture and a jazz community might be news to a lot of people. It's, I have to say it's news to me. I mean, I knew Boston, of course, amazing place for music. I would, I can imagine Providence because of this, because of its size w- would have a, have a good scene, but Newport's a fairly small city or I'm not it sure. Is. I've never, I've never been there actually. Well, you gotta, you gotta come out, Ken. Okay. Um, it, it, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's music all year round, but, but of course the summertime is, it's a great area for tourism, but the, you, there's there's places to go all over town. You don't have to drive very far to hear a good band. Are are there any you know without singling any particular club out? But are there, there there's usually a couple of you know must see ba- must see clubs that that, that are pro- you know extremely reliable in terms of having a lot of jazz and a lot of good jazz. Any any come to mind that you'd share with us? Well, I I do a regular Thursday night gig down at Nori's. N O R E Y S with a friend of mine that I was in the Navy with, and they have jazz every Thursday night there. We just happen to be on the rotation in that venue. There's a place right across the street called the Fifth Element. There's places all over town that uh, the local musicians play at. Do you need a car to get from place to place, or or are they concentrated that you can can walk around? You know, you 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 don't need a car. No, you could you could walk to a lot of places. Absolutely. That's great because that. W- it, that's missing now in, in, in so many cities. New York, of course, still has it. You can go walk from the Blue Note to the Vanguard to the, the old village gate that has jazz sometimes. And, of course, there's a lot of jazz venues. New Orleans has Frenchman Street. You don't even have to leave the block. And there's, right. I, think, I think there's almost 20 places there. You, you might have mentioned this, but did you spend any time in New Orleans? I know there is Navy I uh, did. presence there. Yes, I did. Uh, I was there fairly early in my Navy band career. So yeah, I got a chance to 
to do a little bit of playing down there on the outside and also very busy with the Navy band down there. We played all the, uh, the Mardi Gras parades. I think I did 19 or 20 of those parades and all. So it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great experience. I, I got, got another opportunity to play with some, some Latin bands when I was down there, oh. which was, for me, that was very unique because I really wasn't exposed that much to the, uh, you know, the authentic Latin music and playing in a, in a horn band. So it was, it certainly, certainly opened my eyes and my ears to different styles of music. It was great. That's interesting. That, you know, New Orleans does have a certain, certainly a history of Latin influences. In fact, if I'm correct, the saxophone itself made it to the United States via Mexico. There was actually, you know what, speaking of military bands, I believe it was the Mexican Calvary, ca- Cavalry Band came to play at one of the big cotton expositions or something. It was like a 120-piece unit, and they brought saxophones, and people liked them. And, and next thing you know, there were saxophones all, all over the U.S. Do you happen to recall, I mean, I know it's a while ago, but what kind of Latin music were they playing? Did, did you encounter, were they play, people playing salsa in those days in New Orleans? Or Yes, yes. And, and it was, some, you know, not only in, in the heart of town, but on the outskirts. And, you know, I played in Slidell and Homa, Louisiana, just outside New Orleans proper. So there was a lot of music going on at that time. Yeah, st- still is. It's still an amazingly musical city. If you were to give some advice, because we do have young people that listen to these podcasts, they're interested in, in jazz and in, and in you know, developing themselves as a musician. I mean, you, you've given some great reasons for considering a career in the military. Is there anything that you'd add you know, for somebody that's saying, well, I really love music and I really want to play how how does the military compare, let's say, to other other options, or or what what we've kind of covered it, but it might be might be worthwhile to to review what op you know what opportunities the military offers to trained musicians. Well, there's there's some incredible benefits. Obviously, the number one thing is you know being able to serve your country. I mean, I said earlier that it meant so much to me, and I didn't realize how much how much it meant to me till later on, you know, halfway through my career, what what it really meant, and just seeing. You know, when when you would play for international audiences or just for you know Middle America or somewhere they maybe not have seen a military band, the the sense of pride that the folks have in seeing what you do, which obviously makes you, you know, your your pride build. Um, the great opportunities that you get to play with other professional musicians in that setting. And it's kind of a revolving door because you're basically in one spot for about two or three years and you move on. So within that time, you're playing with a group of musicians that you, one person might be leaving soon. You might get somebody new in a month later. So you have an opportunity to meet other people from all across America and, and listen to their musical influences, which is going to change the way, I guess, you view or play your own music. So, but the, the security, you knowing that, you know, every two weeks you're going to get a paycheck, basically you, you don't get that out on the outside, you know, you you're kind of hustling for gigs, you know, it depends on who you are and who you're playing with. So that sense of security was always a great thing to fall back on or to have. I think just, just the education of it being in, in that kind of environment really helped me out as, you know, not only as a musician, but as a professional, mm-hmm. um, being a professional military musician, you know, just how you carry yourself, what you represent, who you represent. So you always, you, you always looked at your job a little bit differently to make sure, you know, you're always putting your best foot forward because of what you represented. So I think the opportunity also, you know, folks just come in for four years. They want to get a loan repayment, a, a college loan repayment, which the government offers, you know, that kind of thing, you know, they, they might find themselves, you know, I really like this job. I want to stick around. I want to see another part of the world. You know, they, they could be stationed in Newport, Rhode Island, and maybe they want to go over to Italy and they have an opportunity to play in the band over there. They will stick around and, and have a family. And that was another thing, uh, having a family for me was that sense of security and giving them an opportunity to see the world. Just great time. Right. Yeah. Being stationed in, in all kinds of different places. And I imagine, 
you have to wait for opportunities. You can't just declare, hey, I want to go to Italy. But if you're in the in the system and, and you're applying yourself and, and you, you have a good record, when opportunities open up, you have a chance to grab them. Yes, absolutely. Great. Well, Carl, I want to thank you so much for giving us some insight into this world of Navy music, uh, the, the playing, the education involved. It sounds like there's, we didn't mention this, but you, you kind of hinted at it. There, there must be tremendous camaraderie among the, the band members and, you know, a, a desire to excel on the part of everybody in the band. Absolutely. And the friendships that I've they gained uh, over the, you know, the 30 years I was in, you know, still today, I count a lot of those folks as my closest friends. So some great times and very, very proud of the opportunities that I had to serve. Great. So if anybody's in Newport uh, in the near future and it's a Thursday night and they want to hear some great jazz, tell, tell them again where they should go. You know, we're down there on the second Thursday of every month. It's called Norris, N-O-R-E-Y apostrophe S. And some of the best food in town and some great jazz as well. Great. Well, we've been talking with Carl Gerhardt, and he's currently the course director at the U.S. Navy Senior Enlisted Academy. As you can tell, he's got a long history in both playing and directing a musical performance for the Navy in various settings. And he's given us some insight into what that life is like, and it's it's very intriguing. And it, it also helps us understand some of the musicians that have gone through that program and then graduated, in, in quotes, for instance, John Coltrane and Tito Puente and others, it gives us a little more of an understanding what kind of forces formed them as they were young musicians and, and finding their way. And it, and it sounds like, clearly, if you are a, a musician and you want to develop a strong foundation in music, that being part of a program like this has got a lot of a lot of positives and a lot of pluses. And Carl did a great job of giving us an idea of, of how, how, how it works and, and what those pluses are. So Carl, yeah, I, if, if you're playing in the summer, I might do a road trip. Right now it's kind of grim out there. We're recording this in March and where I live, there's a lot of ice on the road, so I'm not going to go anywhere for a while, but I'll get some wanderlust in the summer. And, and if you're still gigging there, uh, you, might, you might see me someday. Fantastic. We'd love to have you, Ken. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Carl Gerhard, U.S. Navy. He's at the U.S. Navy Senior Enlisted Academy as a course director. And thank you so much, Carl, and we'll see you around. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.